if you just stand out there and you speak your mind and you stand on your values, you empower how many other people to come stand with you and say, hey, I agree with that too. Maybe if we stand close to each other, all of us, and we yes. all speak our minds, they can't take us all down. Welcome to the Dr. Jeff Show podcast, where I'm interviewing major thought leaders every week from many different fields of influence to show how our worldview changes everything. Today, we have a bonus episode for you with Libby Emmons. This is a conversation I had with Libby at a national gathering of religious leaders. Libby came out of a progressive leftist feminist mindset. Why does somebody like that change and what can we learn from it? Well, now she's an editor in chief for the Post Millennial and has been published in the New York Post, The Federalist and more. Let's listen into the conversation. Libby Emmons, welcome to the Dr. Jeff Show podcast. Thanks. We're here in the podcast suite at the National Religious Broadcasters Conference, mm -hmm. and I've been really looking forward to this conversation because we did a panel yesterday right. on transgenderism. But your story, I think, will be fascinating to people who are listening as we're talking this month about technology and social media and things like that. You, you went from being someone who I guess you would would you describe yourself as a liberal feminist and then moving toward yeah. being a more conservative? Yeah, I would say that um, I was definitely a liberal feminist, definitely believe in equality under the law. Uh, very, My liberal perspectives were primarily as regards free speech, uh, which I'm still very much a huge proponent of free speech, and being anti-war, which I'm also still anti-war. Uh, shockingly, these are now conservative positions, <laughs> right. um, but they are still my values. Yeah. Well, tell us about that process, because I, I think people tend to get marginalized in certain things. Like if you declare yourself to be a liberal feminist and you try to change, there are a lot of people who would say, wait, 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 no, you're in a box. Mm -hmm. We are not going to let you out of the box. How did you... Well, it was interesting, I think, because um, what primarily happened is that the ground shifted beneath my feet mm -hmm. more than I particularly changed. Um, as I said, free speech, anti-war. Um, I've been pro-life. I was raised Catholic. Um, I was shown <laughs> my entire CCD class in eighth grade was shown a video of an abortion. And I think all of us were pro-life after that forever. It's very hard yeah. to go back on something like that. Um, but the the Democratic Party shifted far left progressive. It became primarily more collectivist, less engaged with the concept of individual rights or liberty. Definitely, it moved away from faith. It used to be that you could be a pro-life um, Catholic Democrat person of faith. This was acceptable. This is no longer something that I think the party values at all. The party values faith in the party, uh, faith mm -hmm. in collectivism, yeah. um, faith in group identities. And this is not something I was ever going to be able to get along with, uh, especially as someone raised Catholic and also as an artist with a background in, um, you know, individual expression. This has always been important to me. That's a significant point. The The education you've had is, mm -hmm. is uh, amazing. You went to Sarah Lawrence College, mm -hmm. which is a very prestigious school. Then you went to Columbia University, which is a very prestigious school. But you mm -hmm. focused on the fine arts. Talk a little bit about your background Yeah, there. so I got involved in making theater at a pretty young age. I was in high school. Um, my grandmother says that when I was five years old, before I even knew how to write, I was... Uh, pretending I was writing plays and I was performing my my neighbor friend Nikki and I we would like dress up in my grandma's wow. old clothes and demand that our family come in from the pool <laughs> and like watch us do these shows um, so I was always very involved in that and I took that to college with me I studied philosophy literature and a lot a lot of theater so um some of my favorites are Samuel Beckett, uh, Ibsen from Norway is one of my mm -hmm. absolute favorites, you know, O'Neill, Chekhov, you know, very steeped in these uh, classical Western playwrights and the kind of expression, um, you know, the Stanislavski method, all of this great stuff. I don't know what uh, oh, that it's is, a, actually. 
well, that's like an entire other podcast, okay. but it's, it's a I'm Russian acting. I'm sure all of our acting. artists are like, oh, uh, duh, Dr. Yeah. Deb. But it's a, it's a Russian acting technique, okay. and it was exemplified also by like Robert De Niro. It's this like, ah, oh, I'm going to be the part, you know, I'm doing the thing. Okay. Anyway, um, so I was very involved in that, took it to college, went to graduate school. I, um, my master's is actually in playwriting which looking back is kind of crazy. I've written like a dozen full length plays. I don't even know how many short plays. Um, and I started to notice in, I would say something like maybe in the neighborhood of 2007, which is when I graduated for, and for the next couple of years, the arts community was changing as well. And it, the concept of the good play became replaced with the concept of the play written by person checking off identity box. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. So when you're a playwright, a lot of what you do is apply for grants because you want to get money so you can run off and bury yourself in your own research and your brain and write a play. Um, and there were a lot of granting organizations for women playwrights. You know, a granting organization wants you to be a woman playwright writing about women's stories perfect. That's easy. I am a woman playwright. I was writing about women's stories. Um, and then the granting guidelines started to shift. And instead of women playwrights, it started to say women or women identified playwrights. Wow. And I'm thinking, what, but, but what is this? What could this mean? You know, I am a woman. I don't necessarily identify as a woman. I just am oh, like, you don't get a lot of choice in the matter. Um, and when I was a kid, when I was in high school, I never wanted to be, I was very insistent. I didn't want to be a woman writer. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to be a writer. And now here, all of a sudden, it's not enough that you have to check off the identity, but yes, I am a woman. Like what's the big deal? You know, now you have to like own some kind of traditional concept of femininity or something, um, to be a woman at all. And then you have to check off this box. So perhaps you could be a man who does that. And I started to get very dismayed. That was across the board, um, with all of the various identities, racial backgrounds, what have you. Some of my colleagues would look at each other and be like, yeah, I have to, you know, I have to write this play in this way because I'm a Hispanic woman and I want to get the money you know, wow. um, and everybody was dismayed by it. South Asian writers, you know, Venezuelan writer, like everybody was just like, uh, oh, now I have to check off the Asian box. You know, it was a thing and it was annoying to all writers who really just wanted to write good plays. It seems like for a while there, there was this big sensitivity to plays that would that were involved in cultural appropriation, right? right? You've, we, we don't want to do that. We don't want to take advantage of people who are from marginalized cultures. But now it almost seems like the shift has been toward we're intentionally going to do this. Mm -hmm. It's like the difference between a poster of a Monet painting and a poster of propaganda. Right. But but similar thing is happening. In, yeah, in this and world. it became propagandist. So the um, the idea in my grad school when I started, we would talk about psychological drama. You know, we would talk about the internal, what have you, of a person's soul and how this is driving them and what whatever else. And by the end of grad school, people were mostly talking about political drama and the infusion of politics into your work. And the idea became that you had to do art activism. So your art had to be expressing some kind of activist viewpoint um, that furthered the progressive cause. And to me, and as I expressed at the time, this really means that we were being taught to write propaganda. I'm not going to be a propagandist. I just cannot get on board with that at all. And neither could a lot of other people. But that is where the money was driving everyone to go. It's where professors who were getting money also driving everyone to go. So it really, um, the entire arts, entertainment and arts moved in that direction. And you can see the result of that now in literally all of our entertainment, mm. you know, which is so um, politics based. You have to think this certain way. The white man has to be a doddering fool. You know, you can't, um, you can't you can no longer express the reality and inner life of characters if it doesn't match the societal perception of what those characters are supposed to be under a progressive political system. Wow. 
Wow. It sounds like the stereotypes then end up getting enshrined. The very things that we were going to try to break down are the things that we are now insisting. Which is exactly what gender ideology is. It's the entrenchment of gender stereotypes that the feminist movement was fighting against, Mm. right? So the feminist movement was saying, listen, all of these things that you say women are, are not necessarily innate to women. Women can exist without having to comply with these gender stereotypes. And now the definition of a transgender woman is a man who complies with feminine gender stereotypes. Right. Makes absolutely no sense. That's right. Well, you're now editor-in-chief of The Post Millennial, and I I wanted us to spend the rest of the time we've got, which I know is only a few minutes. These things go so fast. But talk a little bit about that. I, I think you give a lot of hope to people who think that social media... And technology is is a wasteland and it can never be recovered. Nothing good can be done with it. But you don't feel that way. I don't. Well, we are a, we're a we're a platform that exists entirely online. We don't have a newsstand. You know, we have the postmillennial.com um, slash subscribe. Everyone can come check it out. Um, but we exist in the ether. So our entire distribution method is via social media. It's great to hear that we're giving people hope because I wake up every morning and I look at what's going on in the world and I just think to myself, oh my goodness, we're going to dive into this again today. This is wild. Um, we have a terrific staff, a great group of writers and editors. Uh, Andy No is part of our team. Jack Posobiec. Um, Charlie Kirk is on the human events side and he works with us as well. So yeah, I mean, it's really Katie Davis court out in Seattle, Ari Hoffman, uh, who your listeners might know. He has a great talk radio show out there. So yeah, we dive into this stuff. We, there's a fair bit of gallows humor, I must say. (laughs) (laughs) Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really, I am hopeful. I do feel that in the past year, Um, there has been sort of a corner turned. An example of that is now with this whole kerfuffle about Target promoting, you know, uh, gear for supposed trans kids, which doesn't exist. It's not a thing that exists. But a year ago, I was writing about the, the Target Pride collection, which included breast binders and, uh, what are called packers, which is absolutely an insane fetishistic concept to push on any human beings. Um, But nobody cared. Nobody cared when we were writing about this last year, last year when we were writing about all of the companies putting up their rainbow flags here in the U.S., but not in the Middle East for some crazy reason. I don't know. Um, We were writing about that. And, you know, it it did not make national headlines. Mm -hmm. Now, Target, ban, ban, boycott Target is trending on Twitter. Uh, Dylan Mulvaney's um, disastrous marketing partnership with Bud Light has uh, tanked Bud Light because clearly they went out there and said, hey, guys, we have no idea who our customer base is. Pass it on. Wow. You know, so there has been a difference. Parents have been empowered. I've heard from parents who are like, we see you standing up. You know, we see you speaking your mind. We speak we speak our mind too. J.K. Rowling, I think, has had an impact. And it really shows you, I think, what the power of one voice can do. If you just stand out there and you speak your mind and you stand on your values, you empower how many other people to come stand with you and say, hey, I agree with that too. Maybe if we stand close to each other, all of us, and we all speak our minds, they can't take us all down. Um, And so I think think parents especially, I think moms, and moms are so busy. Moms are always running around. Uh, You have so much to, I mean, dads too, I know, I know, Uh, but moms have so much to do and they feel so much responsibility to do everything all at once with a smile at the same time, Um, which I appreciate and respect, but um, you still got to speak up. Well, post-millennial is is cool because it's got that kind of ironic sensibility approach that mm-hmm. that's that um, that millennials would be comfortable with and that's the the language that a lot of millennials would speak but it's also showing that you could stand for truth across generations mm-hmm. and reach out to to people who are thinking about these things and are moving into positions of leadership so I know people will check that out but thanks so much for being on the show today Libby Thank it was you. really a fun conversation thanks so much Thank you to Libby Emmons for coming on the show today. If you enjoy the show, would you consider leaving a review on your favorite platform? Reviews help more people find the show. 
And if you would like more resources that can help you live out a biblical worldview as a student, parent, educator, or church leader, please go to summit.org slash resources. The articles, the videos, the eBooks, and all the other resources you'll find there can really help you be strong in your faith for such a time as this. We'll see you next week. Hey, are you looking for more great podcasts that can help build your faith and give you inspiration? Our friends at Edify have what you need. You can find more podcasts, including the Dr. Jeff Show podcast on the Edify app. You download it at edify.app or search for it in the Apple Store or the Google Play Store. Spell Edify, E-D-I-F-I.